<clears throat> we come to the uh, last stretch of the Heidelberg Catechism, and I ask you to turn in your hymnals uh, to page 57. This last stretch, by the way, is a stretch of prayer. Uh, that's what this last section is about, actually dealing with the six requests that are in the Lord's Prayer. But today is the introductory uh, one on page 57, Lord's Day number 45. <laughs> I'll read the bold, and you can respond in the fine print. Why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us, and also because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking him for them. How does God want us to pray so that he will listen to us? First, we must pray from the heart to no other than the one true God, who has revealed himself in his word, asking for everything he has commanded us to ask for. Second, we must acknowledge our need and misery, hiding nothing, and humble ourselves in his majestic presence. Third, we must rest upon this unshakable foundation even though we do not deserve it, God will surely listen to our prayer because of Christ our Lord. This is what he promised us in his word. And what did God command us to pray for? Everything we need spiritually and physically as embraced in the prayer Christ our Lord himself taught us. And we will read now again uh, the Lord's Prayer. What is this prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I have two passages to read in the scriptures. The first one is Philippians chapter 4. These are both very uh, well-known texts and very encouraging texts on prayer. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow, there's a very potent passage on the benefits in the life of the believer for prayer. Now, one other passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Again, it begins the same way. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us pray. Father, how we thank you for the gift of prayer and what it means in our lives as your people. Strengthen us now, Lord, we pray, as we consider this and enable us uh, to have good cheer, and to grow a bit in prayer because of this time we've had together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have a uh, copy of the uh, sermon outline today uh, for this message on prayer, you will notice on the back of that outline uh, a shorter, the shorter catechism question that asks, what is prayer? Our catechism doesn't ask that question, and I think it's a good question to ask, well, what is prayer? And so I thought I, I would go ahead and print that up for your edification. Uh, the Shorter Catechism asks, what is prayer? And prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. There's the Shorter Catechism. Uh, one day a couple of older fellows was asking uh, one fellow, it was D.L. Moody actually, was asking the Scottish fellow, they're having a discussion about prayer, and he goes, well, what is prayer? And the Scottish fellow 
called for his little girl, six years old, to come. And he sat her down. He said, now sit down. And she folded up her little hands in her little dress. And he says, honey, what's prayer? And she quoted the Shorter Catechism perfectly. And D.L. Moody says, ah, the Shorter Catechism. What, what, a, what a delight to hear it. So I hope you found that that was a delightful definition of prayer. So what is prayer? Prayer is one half of our dialogue with God. That's what prayer is. And dialogue, if you have dialogue with somebody, that means what? That you don't have a monologue. You know, getting back to ears and mouth, right? Uh, a dialogue is when you two people speak. And generally they're taking turns. They're not speaking in tongues all at the same time. One person speaks, another person is listened. The other person speaks, the other person is listened. And through dialogue is brought about communion between people. You get to know people. You get to feel close to people. And that's what we have with God. We have a dialogue. Prayer is half of that dialogue of communion with God. His word being the other half of the, 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 the formula. How important is it then to pray? I have this little clip from J.C. Ryle. He has a little booklet on practical religion. And one of those uh, chapters is on prayer. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to read you what J.C. Ryle said. I thought this was very important significant in highlights the importance of prayer in the life of the believer. He says, now what is the cause of most backsliding? I believe as a general rule, one of the chief causes is neglect of private prayer. Of course, the secret history of falls will not be known to the last day. I can only give my opinion as a minister of Christ and a student of the heart. That opinion is, I repeat distinctly that backsliding generally first begins with neglect of private prayer. So there you go with J.C. Ryle, which uh, known for his pungency of language. Uh, another question with regard to prayer, I think uh, we can see how important it is uh, in the life of the believer is, is, but there's a, there's a little nagging issue that I think bothers all those who would pray, and that is, and this is particularly if you're a Calvinist now, uh, why pray if God's already got everything planned out? As Isaiah says, he's mapped out the end from the beginning. God has an immutable will that cannot change. He's ruling and reigning. Nothing can forestall his hand. Why bother praying then? Right? That's a very reasonable question. The answer to that question is, the fact of the matter is, God incorporates into his sovereign, immutable plan our prayers so that, and in such a way that, our prayers play an important and significant role in the mapping out and the unfolding of that plan of God. Now, how, how do those two things come together? Uh, I do not know, but I know they come together. And it's because he's in control that our prayers can have a sense of confidence. And it's because we know that he tells us in his word that you have not because you have not, that prayer is important to God's work in the life of every single one of us. Matter of fact, as he ends James chapter 5, speaking of Elijah, uh, he concludes that uh, the prayer of a righteous man, like Elijah, even though he's like the same nature of us, can avail much. So there is a causal outcome of our prayers and what happens in our lives and in the lives of other people. But yet that's all under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. And so we should be able to confidently say that my prayers intersect with God's sovereignty in such a way that he incorporates them in accomplishing what he intends. And thus, we should pray. Well, the very first catechism question asks us, why pray, doesn't it? Why do Christians need to pray? <clears throat> well, the first thing the catechism draws to our attention is, is a means through which we express our thanks. And of course, if you're familiar with the catechism itself, it's divided into three parts. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. And gratitude is a result or the object of God's grace, even though we're guilty. 
And thus we should thank God. Thank God for his grace to us. Thank God for however he has adorned our lives. Uh, we may survey our lives and say, well, what about this I don't have? Or what about this I don't have? And what about this I have and don't want? And, and on and on we can go and find every reason not to give thanks to God. But what we need to do is count what are my desserts? What do I have from God? And what is God after in my life? That will provoke thanksgiving. That will stimulate thanksgiving in our lives. Even as... We read in 1 Thessalonians, didn't we? In all things, give thanks. In all things, give thanks. Now, this is not a morbid and bizarre thanking God for you know, hideous things that may happen in life. But we can thank God he's in control. And he's using all things according to his sovereign good pleasure. And sometimes the things that we might think are the most difficult and unwelcome become the very tools God uses to grow us up in Jesus Christ. So thank God in all things. And Paul says when, when you come before God in Philippians and you, and you want to bring your prayer request because you're so anxious and you're so troubled in soul and you want to bring those requests, Paul says bring those requests so you won't be troubled in soul, but he says bring them with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Because thanksgiving is, there, is the other side, isn't it? It keeps us from being Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me God, and don't forget to do this, and don't forget this, and if you have any angels helping you out, you tell them to get busy on that. No, see, that's not the way prayer is. Prayer is, comes before God, as the catechism says. We come before his majestic presence in humility, and we are to thank him. Prayer expresses that thanks. But prayer not only expresses thanks, but our catechism points out, very rightly so, that... Uh, also, because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly. So some of our greatest needs in our life is for God's grace. God's grace. And how do we lay, lay hold of those spiritual benefits of his grace? We lay hold of them in prayer and, the, and I like how the catechism picking up on Romans chapter 8 says as we groan inwardly you know it is to groan inwardly I mean you're feeling it inside it's not just oh Lord you know give us a safe trip and you know blah 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 it's not casual it's an inward motivation and need that's within that we cry out to God to calm and grant us strength toward our sanctification. We need his strength, his grace, as we what? As we wrestle with our sins. As we wrestle with seeking transformation by faith in Jesus Christ. As we struggle in obedience. We need grace for that. And, and thus we come to the throne of grace. Jesus says that, that um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. That's what our Lord said to Peter, remember? And that's, that's a truth for all believers. The strength in us, our flesh is weak, but that spirit is willing. So Lord, strengthen me. And it's through prayer that we lay hold not only of the grace of his strength, but the grace of his forgiveness. You know, when we're burdened down and weighted down inwardly. Uh, I, I, have a, I have an old friend of mine who, all the way back uh, to my hometown that is a, is a pastor in, in a northern part of California with the uh, Reformed Church of the United States. And, and he says, I would get down on my knees, weighted down in weakness. And I pray and I'd get up with strength. See, he understood prayer, why, why we would pray, to lay hold, to lay hold of the things that God would communicate to the groaning soul of the Christian. 
That's why we find in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verses uh, 16 through 18 about our, uh, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who occupies the throne of grace. He, he's both king and priest. So that why? So that we might receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. See, the temptation is to see the throne of grace. The throne of God is a, is a place where, you know, I'm continually reminded that I'm a rebel before that throne. But Hebrew says, no, that's a priestly as well as a royal throne where there is a repository for the journey of the believer through this world during his time of need. Of what? Grace and mercy. Now think about that. What is grace and mercy? Well, grace is that strengthening to carry on Grace is that strengthening I don't deserve being the, the rebel to the throne that I am to buoy me up, to see me through. And mercy is what? Is, is forgiveness. It's, 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 it's a withdrawal of judgment. And, 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 and there's a great repository of grace and mercy that we are to lay hold of through prayer. Oh, how much we do need to pray, not just as a mechanical and religious procedure, but as recipients of the grace and mercy that God has in Jesus Christ for his saints on the way, on the journey during this time of need. And lastly, why pray is, well, just very simply, and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all over the men's prayer meeting every Thursday about this, is that we pray because we tell God, I am dependent. See, our natural fallen fleshly instinct is to be independent. The self-made man, the successful woman. Mm -mm -mm. Right? But prayer is the opposite. It's standing before God and saying, I am dependent. I'm going against the stream of my fallen nature to say, I need you. And that sets the calipers of our mind, and that tunes our heart on how it should function in this world. So that's why we should pray to express our thanks and receive the innumerable benefits that God would give to those who seek him in prayer. Secondly, how should we pray? <clears throat> now, the catechism is broken down into three Section. I'm going to look at each one of these briefly here. First of all, we should pray truly. Pray truly. We must pray from the heart to no other than the one true God. Pray truly from the heart to the true God who has re revealed himself in the truth of his word, asking for everything he's commanded for us. In other words, we pray truly from the heart means we mean it. It's not a bunch of vacant mumbo jumbo and, you know, did that prayer, you know. What language was that anyway? You know, sounded like Latinese to me. So. But anyway, it was prayer to God. Mystical moment. No, that's not the way it should be. Our heart sh should be truly engaged. I always appreciate what Jesus said about Nathaniel. You know, I saw you under the fig tree. You're an Israelite in whom there's no guile. There's something genuine about Nathaniel that Jesus detected in him. He was true. He was genuine. And you could bank on it that his prayers were not ritualistic prayers. Uh, he meant them. He was a genuine, sincere soul that long for God and so our prayers uh, need uh, to be prayers that are, are from a true heart that are rejecting all idolatry um, uh, prayers to the true God without any interference to true God and based on the truth of his word secondly our prayers according to the catechism should be transparent we should be praying transparently. This is very important. I think this is where we get stuck more than ever in prayer. We're, we're, we, we don't have the time 
of the longing of transparency. Second, we must acknowledge our need and misery, hiding nothing, and humble ourselves in his majestic presence. You know, we can send a lot of different people out there to answer the door when someone knocks socially, you know. But when it comes to God, every single time, he can say, that ain't you. God will say, that's not you, I want you. You send that person back and I want you to come forward with who you are, where you are at right now. Transparency. Transparency, of course, with regard to our sins, but transparency with regard to just who we are, what we're about, how he has made us distinctly. You know, we, can, we can be sincerely deceived, but man, to come to God in prayer is a wonderful arena in which we can become sincerely undeceived because we're, because prayer says to God, search me, O God. Know my heart. Know my anxious thought. Lord, really come and get the veil off my own eyes that I might be transparent with you. And that's, that's what we see when Daniel prayed that long prayer. Daniel was taking the razor blade and just scraping it down close. and was transparent in what he was praying to God in confession. Uh, a long prayer, but I, I love the, the, the short prayer of the, of the repentant publican in Luke 18 13 that very short prayer where it says he was standing uh, far off and would not even lift his eyes to heaven but he beat his chest and his prayer was God be merciful to me a sinner now that as sincere as that brief prayer is of the human heart uh, even that prayer gets used sometimes to be put on a kind of a, a circular wheel. Where you just kind of say over and over, and we shouldn't do that. It, we should be able to say from uh, transparency, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thirdly, God would have us pray trustingly. That's what the third one says. We must rest on this unshakable foundation. That even though we do not deserve it, God will surely listen to our prayer because of Christ our Lord. That is what he has promised us in his word. He will listen to it. And again, Daniel 9, 17 through 9 is, is, is one of the references there, as well as James 1. God will hear the believer's prayer when, it, when we pray how trusting. We trust. We have, we have reasons not to trust God. We have reasons with regard to who we think God is. We have reasons to think who we are. We have reasons to think about, okay, Ali, I've got, look at this fix you've got us into now. How can I possibly trust God now? We have reasons that would say, we're not going to trust. But the catechism rightly corrals us and say, look, what Christ has done for the believer." in Jesus Christ, is a grounds for us to come and trust him. God's made the first move. He has sent Christ into this world of darkness to reach out and retrieve us, to die for our sins, to deal with our issues, so that he might then extend that reach by the power of the Holy Spirit and redemptive application and pour out the love of God to our hearts that we might trust in that love that's been demonstrated and pounded by way of a cross into the ground of history. And thus encourage us to trust him. To trust him because we know not only that he's gracious toward the believer, but we trust him because we know, he, look, he's in control. It might feel like it's out of control. And we've all been through that. I'm out of control. Life's out of control. Well, at those moments, we need to say, Yes, I can't change the fact that I'm processing things are out of control and I'm like just this little tiny speck being whirled around and who knows where I'm going to land, you know. But we should look to God and say, on the basis of your word, you love your people. You hear their prayers. Let me pray trustingly now. James chapter 1 speaks about praying for wisdom. And it's praying for wisdom in the midst of trial. 
But he says, when you pray for wisdom in the midst of trial, James says, you must pray how? Not like the man who's like the waves of the sea, you know, like a ting ping pong ball on the waves of the sea. Each, each wave, ping pong ball gets tossed around, right? But he says, you, should, you must pray believingly, otherwise you're an unstable man. So you pray believing, Lord, I don't have the wisdom, please. I'm praying for your wisdom. Now, that doesn't mean you then crawl inside your little spiritual turtle shell and start listening for wisdom in there. That means you come out of your turtle shell to consider the word of God, seeking wise counsel for your life from those who will counsel you from out of the word of God and seek to hear what God has for you from his word, whether it's through your own reading or listening to sermons or through the counsel of your brothers and sisters or pastor and your elders in your life. But at the end of the day, we should be able to trust God that he's not going to hem us in in such a way that we can't trust him for the way out. As a child trusts his loving parents, so we should trust our Father, who by the grace and mercy in Jesus Christ has demonstrated to us that he welcomes us and that we know he's the sovereign God that's got things under control. Secondly, what, thirdly, is what should we pray Number 18, ask that question. <clears throat> Everything we need spiritually and physically. Now, let me ask you a question. Everything we need spiritually and physically, visibly and invisibly. Is there anything else other than what is visible and invisible? I, I'm just trying to think about that. Is there something like kind of maybe ghostly like? It's not really physical, it's not really spiritual, it's, it's kind of hovering between the two. No, what's the point? The point is all of life. All of life. And if you're parents, you've probably had requests from your children that you said to yourself, I don't know if we should pray about that. <laughs> and maybe you shouldn't. But, you know, you sometimes had requests that are concerns to the child. You know? Can't find that special stuffed animal. Where is it? Well, let's pray about it, you know? You ever stop and pray about where are my keys? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And other things. <laughs> so why can't we pray for our covenant children for where that stuffed animal is? Everything we need physically and spiritually is embraced in the prayer that Christ taught our Lord. I've told my men on Thursday, and I, I, I've mentioned it at the congregation, anytime you pray, you should take cats with you to prayer. Every time you pray. Take cats with you. That's the number one thing you want to take. Why, why do I say take cats with you when you pray? It's not because they purr and they're soft and fuzzy. It's, it's because cats, C-A-T-S, gives you the acrostic for the content of your prayer. There's prayers of confession, C. There's prayers of adoration, where you praise God for who he is and what he's done, A. There's prayers of thanksgiving, for, as we've mentioned, benefits received. And there's prayers of supplication. So your prayer should be well-rounded and full uh, with those aspects of prayer. Or you might want to pray acts instead of cats, starting with adoration. And that's kind of how we do in worship, don't we? We come at adoring God, then we make confession and giving thanks and supplicating him. <laughs> But what has also been given us with regard to the question of what to pray, uh, the Catechism points out, is the Lord's Prayer, because the Lord's Prayer uh, is a model, you might say, for the content of prayer. There are six discrete requests in the Lord's Prayer that help us in our prayers. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Make holy your name. Reverence. Prayer is concerned with reverence for God. Secondly, we pray thy kingdom come, that the kingdom of God may, may increase in this world, that it may be strengthened in this world, and that God might bring his kingdom. Finally and ultimately, you've know, got the already not yet kingdom of God. Thirdly, uh, your will be done in earth as it's done in heaven. Obedience. Think you have the angels in heaven think about disobeying God? You know, when the angel says, go down here and strengthen Hezekiah today, 
He's, uh, he's fumbling around at work. You know, strengthen him. I think the angel says, nah, I'm too busy with, you know, dealing with these other guys over here. No, the angel's always, yes, sir. Obedience. As in heaven, so on earth. We pray for obedience to God's rule. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread for body and soul, both physical and spiritual. We need bread for our, our souls. We need bread for our bodies. And, uh, and what a wonderful answer to prayer. When you come to church on Sunday, and we have a fellowship meal afterwards. There's your answer to prayer. Bread for your soul, bread for your body. We, we should pray for it. You don't have a job, you need a job, pray for that job. Oh, you think God's concerned about whether I have a job? Sure he is. He tells you to pray about it. Matter of fact, God says if you go off thinking you're going to make business some, some city without prayer, you're being presumptive. And you're asking uh, for, tr for trouble from God, according to James chapter 4. So yeah, we pray for, for God to feed us in body and soul. Number five, we pray for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What do we pray for? Well, we're praying. When we pray for forgiveness, what are we praying for? We're praying that uh, evil <coughs> would not overcome us, but we would be forgiven. And the evil would not overcome us in our own hearts by being unforgiving, but forgive others. That we'd receive forgiveness and grant forgiveness. Boy, that's a, that's a core reality of existence. To receive and grant forgiveness, and that's at the heart of Christianity, isn't it? The heart of the new covenant. And lastly, we pray that lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil. We pray, pray for sanctification, pray for spiritual growth, pray to refuse sin when it's dangled before our eyes, or when we feel it's pulled, to be able to have the strength, Lord, deliver us from temptation, deliver us from the evil one, his tricks and his power. So at the end of the matter, pray. That's the end of the matter. <laughs> pray because of Jesus Christ and his work in your behalf reconciling you to the Father in heaven. He has opened up to you a door that no man can shut of access to your Father. So pray. Pray to your Father through Christ, not as a judge. But pray to your Father through Christ as one who is a priest, the great priest that has secured for you a proverbial reservoir of grace and mercy to help in your time of need. And hopefully you will be encouraged. That you'll be encouraged to pray regularly every day intensely without doubting and therein that you will not only talk to God half of the dialogue but you'll commune with God through prayer and Lord willing all of us will know something of that that wonderful verse in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able. And Paul's, that's a reference to God answering prayer. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly.